so much, Stacy. Let me set this up. There we go. So happy International Archaeology Day, first of all. I didn't realize until yesterday that that is today. So happy International Archaeology Day to everyone. Thanks so much to RC Missouri for inviting me to give this keynote and uh, Stacy for the invitation. As Stacy mentioned, my role at the Harvard Art Museums is at this really nice intersection of teaching and working with the Egyptian objects in our care. And I'm hoping that this talk will really give you a sense of that intersection. All of the objects I'm talking about today are ones I teach with at our museum. And I'm gonna share some of what I've learned as I've used them with students and other visitors. Let me just pick this title part a bit before we start. When I say best practices, I really mean it. I feel like I have to say that I, I appreciate theory as part of my duty as an archeologist, but honestly, so many of us just really need some good examples of how we can be teaching with objects. So we're gonna get practical today. I'll be talking about things we can actually do, not just as a thought exercise. And I hope you'll find some inspiration for your own teaching and learning from what we do together today. And when I say learning as we go, I really mean that too, uh, because as we go, I'm gonna be modeling a few different modes of learning that are similar to what I do with students and other visitors at the Harvard Art Museums. So that means, as Stacy said, audience participation. So this talk is meant to be interactive. Please chime in in the chat when I ask you what you think and don't be shy. And finally, just wanna note that that phrase teaching ancient Egypt in museums comes from the volume Stacy mentioned, which I edited with Carl Walsh, Lizette Jimenez and Lisa Haney called Teaching Ancient Egypt in Museums, Pedagogies in Practice, which will be out this spring. And so many of the things that I have learned about best practices, I learned from or alongside my co-editors, as well as the fantastic group of authors in our book. The essays in the book address topics, including working with community partners, applying Egyptian objects to interdisciplinary topics, making ancient Egyptian material accessible to different kinds of audiences, and centering contemporary Egyptian voices. These are topics that I'm not going to be able to dive into today myself, but they're so important and I would love it if you would check them out in the book. So here's our agenda for the next 35 or so minutes. The activities that we're going to do together are in pink and the topics we're gonna to talk about are in white and we'll be alternating between the two. So first we'll do what I call a long look. I'll explain, it won't be that long, but we'll look at something together. Then we'll talk about using objects to challenge preconceptions or assumptions about Egypt. Then we'll do another activity. We'll explore a group of objects together and then talk about using objects to help learners think about collection histories and to do what I call course correcting for past practices. Final activity will be a question generating prompt and then we'll talk about using objects to emphasize ancient personhood and help learners make personal connections to the past. So we'll get started with our first activity. Remember, this is meant to be interactive, so I'm counting on you to chime in in the chat. Your first assignment is to spend a few minutes looking at this photograph. And whenever you're ready in the chat, Tell me some words or phrases that describe what you see. Don't worry about being right or wrong. Just describe what you see. And we'll take a minute or so to do this. Modern Egypt and ancient Egypt says Jennifer Babcock. And if you want to elaborate at all on what you see that makes you say that, pop that in the chat. 1970s, good job. <laughs> Don't always expect uh, visitors to know exactly when a photo is taken. This is from the 1970s. Old and new, Lisa says, um, ads, camel, pyramids, two sphinxes. It's monochrome, it's black and white. Billboards in front of the Great Pyramid black and white photo, advertising. I'll go to another minute or so, or maybe 30 seconds for others. Streetlights, yes. 
yeah, streetlights over here. I'm not sure if you noticed them. There's a modern road. Using ancient monuments for modern graphic advertisement design. Yes, yes. Two different styles of illustration. Mm -hmm. Advertising for ancient monuments in front of the pyramids. And yes, Amanda, there are some people present. There's a person here, for example. Mentioning a distant location. Yeah, okay. So Karnak temples, this is at Giza. And we have a reference to somewhere that is actually quite far away from Giza. And yeah, Jennifer, Arabic, English, and French languages. Awesome. So uh, thanks for participating in this quick uh, look at this photo together. I'm going to add some caption information here. So um, this photo is actually on view in our ancient Egyptian gallery at the Harvard Art Museums right now. And uh, it was taken at Giza in 1976 by the American photographer Bill Dane, who then sent it as a postcard to someone at Harvard the following year. So that's why it's captioned with 1977. And I want to thank my Egyptian colleague, Mina Milad, for uh, translating the Arabic text in the photo for me and providing a little more information about the period when this was taken. So um, these are advertising, the sound and light shows, the billboard on the left says in Arabic, sound and light. The one on the right says sound and light in Arabic and French. And it also says in Arabic, Karnak, temples and Luxor. So these are advertisements for the sound and light shows in both places, which you can still see today. The one in Giza began in 1961, but in Karnak, it didn't start until 1972. So it was actually relatively new at this time. And thus the new kind of promotion for people who are visiting Giza to maybe make the trip down to Luxor uh, to see the other one. And um, Mina reminded me that 1977 is the same year that the James Bond movie, The Spy Who Loved Me, was out. And that movie had shots in both locations, one of which was at Giza during the Sound and Light show. So it was um, still quite present in popular culture in the U.S. at this moment. So as you all noticed, the photo shows this famous place as an intersection of the ancient and the modern, we have, for example, technology from both times evoked here. So the technology of pyramid building, the technology of sound and light shows, it shows how this place is viewed by foreign tourists, both French and English speakers, but also Arabic speakers. And it shows this actual like layering of these two moments of ancient and modern with this particular view from the photographer showing the billboards blocking our view of these iconic monuments in the background. And it's an American's view of Egypt as well. It's one that is by virtue of its title, which is my pleasure, associated with entertainment. So our collection doesn't have a photo of this kind by an Egyptian photographer, but if we did, I might've put the two in dialogue with each other to also get at their different perspectives on Egypt. So what we just did and the way we just talked about this a little bit in the chat, which feels different in person, usually I would do it as a conversation in person. It's what I call a long look. It's a fairly unstructured, open conversation. The main aim is simply exploring an image or an object together. And it warms a group up, doesn't rely on prior knowledge about what you're seeing, puts everyone on a level playing field with each other and shows you that you can look at an object and have something to contribute even if you aren't a quote unquote museum person. I like to do a long look as my opening exercise for every interdisciplinary or entry level class that visits our museum, but I also do it for public tours where their audience is usually from different backgrounds and levels of experience. And this is a strategy that's really great for any age. It just depends on what you're using um, for your look. Now, I did this with you all first. And I cannot overstate the fact that the order in which we do things when we teach with objects, just like the order of a syllabus for a class is so important. So one major thing I've learned, really this applies outside of just teaching with Egyptian objects, but for object-based learning kind of generally is, I think it's really important for ancient art, which is not always so accessible to people, it's helpful to scaffold activities in an order that allows people to become more confident and encourages more independent exploration as the lesson goes on. 
For me, that usually means taking a kind of funnel shaped approach. So I'll start with a large format, single object that we look at together in a very open exploratory kind of way where it might be the first time you're looking at something, but you're able to learn how to look as you do it. And then I'll move to an activity that's guided a little less by me and a little more by learners making their own connections, like doing an activity in pairs or doing a compare and contrast. And then eventually I move to an activity where learners really have a lot of agency over what they're looking at. So I might ask them to choose which object they wanna talk about from a larger group of objects. And I'll usually leave them to discuss whatever they choose in kind of small groups and they sort of share out to everyone at the end. Um, and then we can introduce supplementary information and talk about it together. So they really kind of own their own experience with that object. For our long look, I chose a photo because we're all used to looking at photos. We see them almost every day on our phones at least. And I chose a photo that I knew would help reinforce the way ancient and modern Egypt are in dialogue with each other and the way that foreigners typically see Egypt as a place for tourism and consumerism and entertainment. And for learners looking at something like this for the first time, it can be a powerful way of challenging assumptions about Egypt as being an ancient place only. And that can be especially useful when you use an image like this first before the group looks at anything ancient to remind them that Egypt is a modern place too before you dive into that ancient stuff. And I think you could do something like this with any modern photo that shows the ancient and contemporary elements of Egypt in the same frame, maybe even a photo you took yourself. Let me show you another object I use to challenge prevailing ways of thinking about ancient Egypt. This, which I know some of you have seen before because I recently published it, is a tomb lintel belonging to an old kingdom official named Tashepses or Impi. And I like to use this object for a long look, especially with kids. The reason why is that it's image heavy, it's easy for them to say what they see, they recognize that there are people and they recognize that there are hieroglyphs, but they also almost always say, that these two people, this guy and this guy are enemies and that these three people are slaves, which they are not. This is actually Impy himself. He's being shown two times and these are his daughters and, and that's his wife and son. The whole thing shows him and his family. It talks about who they were and what his job was. And I tell students that they can think of it kind of like a family portrait. So I know that kids are almost always going to jump to these conclusions at first. And I'm using this object to explicitly counter this idea that the ancient world was driven solely by power structures and conflict and that everything has to relate somehow to hierarchy or slavery, which I find a lot of people still think is how the pyramids were built. So this is another assumption that we really need to work on countering. Kids who look at this also often assume that we're seeing a king here because of the iconography we're used to seeing uh, to do with authority, or maybe they recognize this wig as sort of similar to the a wig they might've seen in an image of a king. So when we look at this together, I also have the opportunity to tell them that there were ordinary people in ancient Egypt too. Or in this case, Impi is an official. He's not the most ordinary person, but he's non-royal. So it's a strategically chosen object. And the main takeaway I expect learners to have from it eventually is that most people weren't royal. Ancient Egyptian people had families like we do, which is a very relatable thing for children, that they had lives that they wanted people to remember and that they had loving relationships with both the living and the dead. And again, I think you could do something like this with any funerary object that shows a family group. So kind of bring that issue to the fore and address it head on, those assumptions. I wanna move into our next activity. We're gonna briefly explore a group of objects together. And I think that this is a simple but very powerful strategy for getting people to notice patterns on their own and generate questions that relate to the original function of objects, but also to their histories in museums. 
So usually when I do this, I use a very large assortment of objects like this, and I bring them out of storage for students to handle. So each student gets one, or I give them a related group uh, that look very similar, and they get to handle them with the museum gloves on so they can have that tactile experience as we're talking about them. But for all of us today, I have a small selection that performs well on Zoom, I think. So this is our group of objects. And let's spend a couple of minutes looking at these four together. So you have the front and back of each. And I want you to pay particular attention to things that they have in common with each other and things that are different between them and also to any modern elements that you notice. And just like before, when you have something to say, you can pop those observations in the chat. And I'll just make sure that you have that uh, prompt in the chat as well. So particular attention to things they have in common, things that are different, and any modern elements you notice. Yeah, so right away, Amanda noticed there is a modern thing here. There's a mount, <laughs> not, not from the original object up on the top right. Lisa says they have the same basic form but there's differences in quality and there are modern numbers, there are stickers and tags. Yeah, so that's a modern number here on the back. There are stickers here, those are modern. They have labels on a few of them. Aha, Kathleen Shepherd. <laughs> that we got an object in 2019. Yes, and we will talk about what that number means, but that number does mean that this came into the museum in 2019, yeah. Joseph says they're Ushabtis. That is what they are. They are funerary figurines called Ushabtis. Usually students don't know what these are. I know they're in so many different museums and people think um, that, well, I guess people in our world think that everyone knows what they are, but most people actually don't. And so I do introduce that to them as we are looking. Sometimes I'll tell students, everything on this table is a type of object called an Ushabti. And so we're all looking at different versions of the same thing. And then we can sort of have the conversation from there. So Sarah says that the label on the first one obscures the back. Yes, yeah, so it's sort of kind of like the billboards in the Giza photo, actually, um, the sort of ancient obscured by the modern, maybe not in the most helpful way. They seem to be made of different materials. They are made of different materials. They're all what we might call ceramic, but they're different kinds. Um, we'll talk about that in a moment. We see wigs different implements in their hands. These are usually um, their picks or plows or both the, the implements of agricultural labor. There's a bag of seeds on the back. So here it's over his shoulder, here it's on her back. Um, mostly the same, Amanda says. So there's a on the back here, on the back here, on the back here, but one is different. So you're sort of starting to notice those patterns. It's the same kind of thing, but slight differences. Right, similar shapes, different colors. One has writing and details done in relief, Jennifer says, and others have painted details. Yes, so this is painted, this is painted, this is painted. This is um, impressed or inscribed. Yes, and the, the way that the inscriptions are arranged are also different. So we have horizontal bands here, we have something vertical here and vertical here and vertical here. There's a kind of mummy shape, we call the mama form. That's how we know they relate to someone who is deceased. They have the hands kind of crossed across the chest. And Clara, I'll take your comment as the last one I'll read aloud. Fiance, fiance. This is the material that these two on the top are made of, whereas the bottom two are made of clay. All right, fantastic. And you know, it's obviously feels a little bit different to do this in the chat. It's so much more conversational uh, when you do this in person, but, uh, I'm sure that you kind of understand the difference um, and it's working within the uh, the Zoom uh, atmosphere. But thank you so much for those observations. So I chose these four objects specifically. We have about 50 Ushabtis in our care at the Harvard Art Museums. I chose these four specifically because as a group, in a way that I think they can really only do as a group, 
they allowed you to make your own observations that would eventually lead us to be able to talk about a whole list of things that I really wanted to come up. <laughs> so those things include, and you know, I know many, of most of you are Egyptologists or sort of adjacent to Egyptology. And so you know what these are already, but you know, imagine what this feels like as a, a student probably holding an ancient object for the first time, encountering an ancient object in this really intimate way for the first time. So this grouping allows us to talk about what this kind of object is, that they are Ushabtis, they're funerary figurines that do your chores for you in the afterlife, how this type of object varies stylistically, and then by extension, how those variations in style can help us date them. This is a great object for thinking about trends and styles aesthetically over time. Uh, the fact that these objects were mass produced and also made to be in sets of many belonging to one person. I know nobody said this, but I was trying to hint at this by including two that belong to the same person, um, which also have small variations between them that speak to this process of a workshop making many at one time. Um, usually when I do this, like I, I'll group, I have, we have um, one group of four from the same person, for example, and a few groups of two or three from the same person. And so some students will just get one and some students will get a, a tray of many and they figured out that this is a, a, they're made in multiples for the same person because some of them have multiples to do that with. Um, you already mentioned Egyptian language and inscription. We see the differences between that. So what's written on them, which in one case is the full, what we call Ushabti spell um, from the Book of the Dead that activates the object, but the others have personal names and titles. So these are um, the personal names and titles of real ancient people that we're encountering. Those variations in material, that was on my list too. Um, so we get to learn about some particularly meaningful materials that have to do with funerary objects, faience being one of them this um, amazing kind of silica-based ceramic that turns itself blue or green in the kiln and blue and green are associated with rebirth and regeneration and the object is kind of reborn as it's fired. So it's really appropriate material for funerary objects. But we also have Egyptian blue pigment on the hair here. And even the clay one um, is really uh, interesting because these here where I have my mouse, those are the fingerprints of the ancient person who made this on the back from when they're pressing it into a single-sided mold. So we get this nice connection materially to a real ancient person. And maybe most importantly, what someone mentioned right up front is the object numbers. So I know you can see the stickers, you can see the painted on numbers that you mentioned. Usually when I teach with these in person, they also have tags on them, like physical tags, like with a loop with string, um, that have those numbers. And so you notice them right away. They also have barcodes on them just because of the way we track objects. So it's a chance to teach learners what those numbers are. And in my experience, most people don't know what they are. And for those of you who don't know, they are not just on ancient objects, they're on every object. Um, and in our system, most American museums, a lot of European museums, the first part before the period is the year that the object entered your collection. So I can explain that these objects came here in 1919, this one came here in 1924, this one came here in 2019. And when you compare them, they can tell you about the origins of multiple objects that were acquired together and the history of how our collection was built. So I love to talk about object numbers with people and I feel like this is such a great intersection where some of them are physically on the ancient object to think about um, how those ancient and modern histories are intertwined. So I wanna slide right into this next topic that's related to this group of objects to underscore that looking together at a group of the same type from different sources is also a really great way to teach people about, for example, what the pros and cons of splitting up archeological assemblages are. So I often ask students this when they handle Ushabtis and some are gonna say, well, one pro is that lots of different people in museums around the world get to learn from these objects now. So for example, this one, Matka Ray, she has other examples in some major museums and they might say, well, we get to look at this one here as students at Harvard, we get to study it here. We don't have to go you know, to, for example, the Brooklyn Museum to look at theirs or the Met to look at theirs. And then other students will say, well, some cons are that we could be missing information if we're only looking at one from a group. And that's absolutely true. Um, and also that taking these objects out of the tomb at all, not just away from each other, 
is not in line with the wishes of the ancient person that they belong to. So that's an interesting conversation that we almost always have with a group like this. You can also talk about what provenance is, the, the trajectory of an object's life and why it matters. And I have to say that if you're teaching with museum objects, no matter what Egyptian objects you're teaching with, teaching about provenance is implicit in teaching with Egyptian objects in museums. So I'm really a believer in the fact that we need to lean into that, even if it opens up some gaps in our object histories, because it explains why we even have Egyptian objects in foreign museums to begin with. And I find that more and more students are really aware of these issues about provenance, um, maybe because of some of the higher profile cases recently or because of the um, repatriation efforts with the Benin bronzes, but they are aware of it and um, they want to be talking about it. They wanna know how we got what is at our museum. Um, you can also use these objects to talk about the 1970 UNESCO Convention. So this is an uh, agreement that governs the trade and trafficking of antiquities that places 1970 as a universal standard for legal um, ownership of an object that has uh, exited its country of origin. And you can talk about what the object number and the provenance together can tell us about the object's legal status. So I will tell you about 2019, for example. This number tells us that Nesba Nabjad's Ushabti came here in 2019. It was a donation in 2019. However, that does not tell you everything. If you look at the provenance of this object, it has a solid provenance. It was sold in Cairo at an antiquity shop in 1905. So it was donated to us after 1970, but it was legally outside of the United uh, out of Egypt um, in 1905. And a group like this also allows us to talk about the fact that it's kind of related, um, as I like to remind our students, that legal and ethical are two different things. So we can have opinions now about things that were done to Egyptian objects in the past, like splitting up a tomb and selling the parts to people around the world, and we can understand that those were legal and even common things to do at the time, but we can also say that we don't agree with them now by the standards of our own time. So another thing that I've learned is really powerful for people, especially college students and other visitors who do often come to museums knowing something about looting or repatriation or how museums have not always operated in ethical ways is what I like to call course correcting. <laughs> course correction for these unsavory past practices. And that takes the form of talking openly about them. So we shouldn't shy away from discussing things we wouldn't do anymore or from discussing objects that show things we wouldn't do anymore really tangibly. Um, and I'm just gonna bring us back to Impey's lintel that we saw before for a second because I think it's relevant again here too. When I talk about this object, this is one I talked about with you know kids and thinking about uh, power structures and slavery. I also often devote, especially with adults, some time to that break in the middle because that break was made on purpose. Those are saw marks here that you can see in the center. We don't know when, but at some point before this came to our museum, this object was split up into pieces, probably to sell separately on the art market. And because of that, the middle is now missing. So I tell people that this happened and how unfortunate it is. And I say that what we have here are two perspectives on the same ethical problem. We have the modern perspective, which is that this is a past practice we would not engage in today in archaeology. And it robs us of additional knowledge about this object and its owner. And then we have the ancient perspective because the part that is missing here in the middle, and I think if you can read Egyptian, some of you can, you'll know immediately what it is. That part that's missing is what we call the offering formula. It's the text that allows Impi to have what he needs in the afterlife. And so the fact that someone took that part away is really unfortunate for him and for his afterlife. So two perspectives on the same ethical problem. And my colleague, Caitlin Clerken and I have actually moved these two parts of this object farther apart in the gallery now. So this is how they look and display now. They're no longer separated by, you know, just like an inch or two um, with a new label that talks about that absence because there is just so much more that's missing than what we used to be showing people. 
So we're really drawing attention to that absence so we can have that conversation. We're not shying away from it. And students really appreciate that because it's a sign that we are willing to discuss the difficult histories of archaeology and museums. And they can ask us questions and not feel that we feel we're being you know, attacked. Also, because I like to tell them, like, we didn't do this, right? That's what course correcting means to me. These things happened before we today had a chance to have a say. And so now we have a say. And when we talk about them, we're able to, um, to put us back on sort of the right path and use these as examples of things we wouldn't do anymore. All right, I'm going to move to our last activity, which is a short exercise that I invite you to do in the chat. Uh, and this is, uh, you know, I told you to take a funnel shaped approach. I give people more agency. This is a choose your own adventure prompt. So I'm going to give you some agency here. I'll show you a slide with two objects and you can pick the one that interests you most and answer the prompt about just that object. All right. So choose one object. Please read the information below it and think of one or two questions you would ask the museum about it. And then feel free to write them in the chat. Don't worry, I'll give you enough time for this one. I know you need at least a minute to digest that information formulate your question. One thing that I think should always, you, many of you know this already, you should always be giving people enough time to do an activity in whatever mode you choose. So take your time with this one. David asks, why does the Canopic jar have his mother's name as well? Ah, that's actually not a question I've ever gotten about this object. <laughs> um, great. Great question. Does the canopic jar still have organic matter in it? It does not. Um, so uh, I uh, have in the description here, once contained his mummified lungs, but it does not anymore. Kathleen's asking about the donors of these objects, who are the Nortons? Mm -hmm. Those are two sisters who are related to someone who was teaching at Harvard. Why is there not a head on the canopic jar? Ah, Sarah, there is. It's a baboon head, but you just can't see from this photo. Apologies for that. <laughs> at what time did, okay, so I think that, that second part of your question um, is uh, has been kind of amended. For the object on the left, do we know where the mummified body of this woman is and what happened to it? That's a great question. Can you show how the funerary portrait was originally shown with the mummy? Amanda, this is such a good question. And, you know, I was thinking about whether or not to show an image of what it would look like with one of these portraits incorporated into the wrappings. But um, ethically, I don't like to show images of human remains. And so um, when we had a recent uh, exhibition of these portraits, I actually did a cartoon illustration of wrappings around a portrait. It's not this one though, so I didn't include it, but um, you can imagine that it's almost like a mask over the face and the wrappings are sort of around the frame of it. But we got around the problem of showing people images of human remains by having a sort of cartoon drawing of the, the wrappings in that case. Lisa says, I'm not following directions, but do you always write the dates out in this manner or do you give number dates too? My research question is what happened to the woman's body? Okay. Um, I've, uh, we do write, we write dynasty dates. We write um, number dates. It just depends. In this case, they're, they both have very general date ranges. So we have the general date ranges here. Where are Pop Hair Nature's other canopic jars? So if you, um, if you're familiar uh, with canopic jars, you will know that there are always four of them, one each for the stomach, intestine, liver, and lungs. So this is one, where are the others? All right, and I'll just take a couple more that I'll read out loud. Do we know where the other parts of the canopic jar assemblage are? 
How about the other Kenobi jars? <laughs> yes. I will get to this, I promise. Um, whose tomb was he buried in? What is the chemical composition of the paint on the portrait? Right? Provenance information about the funerary portrait. Okay, fantastic. I can tell a lot of these are very Egyptological questions. Um, so the goal of this exercise is, um, you know, think think of also like what this kind of question and what this sort of information would feel like when it's digested by a non-specialist or by a student as well. The goal of the exercise is for learners to generate their own questions based on their own interest, but at the same time to eventually lead us to certain particular topics that I have chosen. And so the supplementary information that I gave you, um, which I, I carefully worded that, and I did that in a way to spur certain kinds of responses. It doesn't always work, but you basically got uh, to most of them. What I was hoping for was that you'd see things like unnamed woman and once attached and once contained and begin to think about the people behind these objects and what happened to them. So even though there are no mummified human bodies in our care at the Harvard Art Museums, both of these objects have been really effective for encouraging students to confront the place of mummified people and other objects that are intimately associated with them in museums and to grapple with the fact that many people are so used to seeing bodies presented as objects in museums, it's so normal that we're kind of desensitized to it. So last semester, I had a class look at this funerary portrait. And after we talked about what it was, I said, well, what do you think about the place of mummified people in museums? And one student said to me that they just hadn't even thought of them as people before. And both objects push us further then because of what they are and how they're implicated uh, in, in the, with, with the body to consider the absence of their owner's bodies, which is another unfortunate part of the story in both cases. So I found also that the jar in particular, along with other objects that have people's personal names on them, like the Ushabtis, for example, that's really effective for illustrating the importance of a person's name in ancient Egypt and its close relationship to memory and to the afterlife. And then the fact that the woman on the left is unnamed, I think stings that much more. And it brings this kind of like welcome discomfort to the conversation um, that's really asking for that kind of course correction that I was talking about earlier. We don't shy away from talking about the fact that we don't get to know who she was. I do tell visitors that we're always hoping to give ancient people back some of their personhood when we can. And it's important to use ancient people's names when we're discussing their objects, if we know them as a matter of respect. It's kind of the least we can do since we know they didn't want their burials to be disturbed and we know they wanted to be remembered. And so in some of our labels, we've actually started to more clearly identify the names of the people that the objects belong to and also add English pronunciations of their names so that people can say them out loud. So to answer some of your questions, each of these objects also has an ongoing research story, which helps illuminate their separation from their owners. So I found it very important. Uh, I think it's very important to visitors to openly share this kind of research and how we know what we know as well as what we still don't know or will never know and why we will never know it, because that's another way of being transparent about Egyptological practices and museum practices. And again, reinforcing how past practices have real effects on what we can learn now. It also bases their consumption of information about ancient Egypt in facts, <laughs> um, which I think we can all agree are, are sorely needed in today's climate. So. The jar, for example, it actually has a companion, um, which I recently tracked down at the De Young Museum in San Francisco. You have to excuse the really awful photo that I was able to find of this object, but this is part of the story of how we're trying to recover as much information as we can about this person and these objects. Um, and so doing so, finding one of the other canopic jars has helped us refine our provenance for the jar at our museum because the one in San Francisco is known to have been purchased directly 
from the sales room of the Giza Museum. Yes, that was a thing that people did in 1901. So we can say with some certainty that the one at our museum was purchased in the same way, just by a different person. It was purchased by the person who eventually gave it to us um, rather than de Young, who uh, had the San Francisco jar. So this helps fill in the picture of how Pat Hernacher's funerary assemblage was dispersed around the world. And it leads to questions from students like, well, where are the other two? And the answer is, I don't know. And I don't know because of how this assemblage was split up because of those past practices. How we know what we know is also a great lens on provenance. In fact, my colleagues and I have tackled this in some of our recent labels for Egyptian objects. So usually a museum label has a simple credit line like this. That's fairly intelligible to people, but a lot of people don't read labels. And uh, I have an intern working with you right now who's actually putting together like a guide to how to, almost like a, a kind of museum lingo guide, a guide to how to read labels. So even something as simple as this is not Oh, if it's not a gift, especially if it's like a bequest, who knows what a bequest is? Um, it's not common terminology. So fairly intelligible, but not always is the credit line. And that's usually in the label. And then um, on the museum website, in our case, it's on the website. And I think most of the time that's true um, or in the, the deeper kind of records of the museum, um, you can find more than just the donor who gave it last to the institution you can find the provenance line itself. That is usually more detailed, but it's presented in this way that provenance just is. This is sort of like the, the way that you do provenance, the way you, you list provenance is as a um, string of inaccessible phrases separated by semicolons, which is not very accessible. So, I mean, who can read this and really parse what is happening here? Uh, I think not uh, your average visitor. So we did this uh, in our label instead. This text is from our recent funerary portraits exhibition. What we are doing here is narrativizing the provenance line for every object to make everything that we know about its history as accessible as possible. So now you can read the provenance line information as if it's a story of the object's life. And the story is missing some pieces, which helps us understand the limits of our knowledge based on how this portrait came out of the ground. And I've just got an image of the back of the portrait here because you can see the back in the way this is displayed in the gallery. And then the um, description references the purple stamp that you can see. So that's the evidence as indicated by the purple stamp, here's how we know what we know. Um, we've done this with some of our reliefs too. Actually, Impy, oh, Impy, he just got one of these too. So um, step by step, making this kind of information more intelligible to people, but that also opens up these holes and gaps. Um, and again, we should be talking about them. So as for ongoing research that helps illuminate this portrait separation from its owner, the portrait has been x-rayed and the x-ray reveals that its original shape was a sort of upside down U. So you can see that there, um, which makes sense for its original function. It was not supposed to be a rectangle, <laughs> um, but the x-ray reveals, if you see here, these, these are these like uh, white lines um, that at some point before this came to our museum, someone used metal nails to attach pieces of modern wood to the outside of this portrait. So you can see maybe on the left here, if you follow my mouse, the original shape, the rest is modern wood. Someone did this to make the portrait either more attractive for the art market or more attractive um, for a current owner and uh, to appear like a European portrait to appear like a portrait that hangs on a wall and therefore obscuring um, the original function. And so our research into the life of this object shows the lengths that someone went to do that. Students find this really shocking and it hammers home for them how strange it is that museums have these funerary objects all over the place that are often sort of sanitized and treated as if they aren't funerary objects at all. Last thing before we conclude, what about that personal connections part? Well, I'm a real 
big believer in teaching in ways that center learners' own perspectives and backgrounds and interests. It's a way to keep people engaged and invested, especially since most people don't become professional Egyptologists. When they're learning with us, they have this fleeting moment where we can impress on them the importance of the past to our own contemporary lives, no matter what they go on to do. So I want to give you just a, one recent anecdote about this portrait that I think speaks to a really nice personal connection. So um, Stacy mentioned I teach some medical humanities programs at our museum for uh, residents and other practitioners at Harvard Medical School. We work on all different kinds of things together. Some of the topics we address, for example, empathy um, and cultural sensitivity and narrative. Um, and if you want to hear more about that part of my work, I'll be talking about that at ASOR next month. But I had one of these sessions recently with some global health residents. And when I told them what this portrait was originally supposed to be, one of them said, you know, the first thing that comes to my mind is organ donation. How much consent a modern person in the United States has over what happens to their body when they die. And we used that moment when this cohort of doctors recognized how much control and agency we have over our own bodies, even in death, to see the lack of consent given to ancient bodies inside and outside museums and the consequences of that more clearly. So some takeaways from what we just did, just to summarize, think about scaffolding activities to give learners more agency and more confidence as you go on use objects to challenge preconceptions or assumptions about Egypt, and to help learners think about collection histories and to course correct for unsavory past practices, to emphasize ancient personhood and help learners make personal connections to the past and to discuss ongoing research and explain how we know what we know and what we don't know and why. Thank you so much. And uh, I think we're very short on time for questions, but I'm happy to take some if uh, I'm allowed to. Yes.